Oh, I have a few questions, actually. So if I heard correctly, right, like you said the fair value is around 11 or so dollars. Yeah. So, I mean, we can say like AMC is pretty much trading right now at fair value. Yeah. So, um, you know, my question is, is is because like this is like a huge following stock right like almost like a cult stock so right why don't you think that is like factored in like if we just trade it on fundamentals like tesla should maybe be like a hundred bucks right so i disagree i think tesla is actually kind of cheap um so i i so why do you think that doesn't trade at fundamentals but amc does well i think that that you you know like i said i mean if you model out 20 stocks, you should get 10, 15, more like 18 that are fairly valued and one or two that are cheaper and one or two that are expensive. And you can buy the expensive, buy the cheap ones and short the expensive ones. And that's worked for me and it's called long short equity investing. Uh, Lots of hedge funds did it, probably most famously the Tiger hedge funds. Uh, uh, The Tiger Cubs have had an unparalleled track record of success. Uh, Funds like Lone Pine, um, Tiger, Global itself, and even though it's having a very rough year, Viking, which I think had one down year in its entire existence, which is now almost thirty years, Maverick, so forth. I worked for a Tiger Cub. I um, use that style of deep research: uh, buy one side, short the other side. Um, for me, AMC represents a fair value. Most stocks represent a fair value. Of course, I could be wrong. Um, I've looked at a lot of stocks where I said, oh, this is fairly valued and it went up 10x. You know, it's not a perfect science. If investing was a perfect science, uh, we wouldn't have to invest. Um, but uh, that's sort of the tea leaves as I'm reading them. Yeah, no, because I mean, I understand what you're saying, but it just seems a little bit strange. A stock that is that popular, you know, trades at fair value. I mean, because not all stocks just trade at fundamentals, right? And so I guess the other So, yeah, I think like, that's a philosophical like, disagreement. I, I actually do think um, the market is an information uh, arbitrage machine and investors take in information and they um, basically process that information and reflect that information in the stock price. That's what most people call efficient markets hypothesis, right? There's no nothing new about what I'm saying. Uh, and it applies whether a stock has had a mania, a stock has had... Um, you know, lots of observers and, and traders or no observers and traders. Like to me, it's all like the same basically. So is there anything in your opinion, like anyone can do to make that stock go up or is it simply just part of great question? Wall Street controls? Yeah, I don't think so. Cause remember wall street is, is every single investor, right? When you buy a share of AMC, you're part of wall street. When a hedge fund manager shorts a million shares of AMC, he's part of wall street. And when a mutual fund uh, index fund buys 5 million shares of AMC, that's Wall Street too. And the reason that stocks will stay at the right prices is because on the precipice of every trade, there's a seller and a buyer, whether that's a long seller, somebody who owns the stock and they're just sick of it perhaps, or a short seller who's brand new in the position and thinks it's going to go to one, so they start shorting. Either seller keeps the price honest. And the same thing applies to the buyer. Whether that's a short seller who's been in the stock a long time and he's frustrated or maybe he's made money and he wants to get out and he buys the stock or a new long buyer who says, you know, I'm interested in this AMC. I just looked at it. Let me buy $5,000 worth. All the long buyers and long, uh, all the long buyers and all the long sellers uh, keep the market honest. And I don't think there's anything that one set of players can do to stymie the others from doing so. Because remember, we have a last sale um, principle here. Every single stock in the stock market, it doesn't matter if a million shares trade or one share trades. I think the rule is 100 shares as the minimum. But whatever the last trade is, that's the trade that stands for the current price. And that means that even if 95% of people take their AMC, convert it to a certificate, put it in their drawers and say, I'm never, ever going to, I'm going to light this on fire. (laughs) Like, right? The last 5% of the traders will still set the price irrespective of those last 95%. So if it's just 5% trading, uh, 95% is locked up because it, of diamond hands or because of, for example, a CEO that, that owns uh, uh, 95% of the stock, You know, which uh, happens sometimes in business where 95% of the stock is held by a family. And I encourage you to go look at 90%, 50%, 80% uh, 
own stocks by by major families in Europe. There's a lot of these, less so in the U.S. But in Europe, you have this kind of aristocratic. Yeah. Dyn- it's, it's, a, it's one in the U.S. It's mainly owned by that one family. There's a lot. There's a ton, right? Uh, look at Berkshire Hathaway. Um, you know, so there's tons of companies like that, and. They still have price discovery. When there's good news, their prices go up. When there's bad news, their prices go down. It really doesn't make a difference. I think market participants try, you know, at least maybe some of them try to think of themselves as more important than they actually are. Like at the end of the day, the market, if there's one thing that's like kind of indestructible in the world, it's the market system. <laughs> like it's really hard to like with the market system. It just works in the long run. It always has. And I kind of think it always will. You're, you're cutting in and out um, a little bit. I was I just going to say, me, but if, so do you think like the run up to 70 then was just a ton of people buying at once, like an anomaly kind of thing, since, you know, you said it doesn't matter, had like a mania type of thing. Do you think that was like an anomaly? It was a gamma squeeze. Yeah, I think in the, well, whether it's a gamma squeeze or not, um, in the long run, these prices uh, uh, shake themselves out. For example, there was a, a weed stock called Tilray which had a very large uh, uh, ownership by private equity. And I was short till Ray and the stock went from 10 to or 20 to 200. And it was a really, really painful trade for me. And I lost a good amount of money. This is while I was in prison. Uh, I was trading for my interactive brokers account while I was in prison. And um, it was a, uh, it was really frustrating. Um, and it is what it is. The life of a long short equity person, you're not always right. And hopefully you have more successes, but that was one, for me where this I was right in the long run Tilray isn't worth anything the whole sort of recreational cannabis business is kind of not really good business but I I, I shorted at 100 I shorted at 150 and at 200 I said you know <sighs> this this is painful and I, I got out um, and of course the stocks at like 10 or 20 bucks a day so the point is that so, so-called squeezes happen momentum happens all those short-term things happen depending on the gyration of market participants. But in the long run, you know, the, the fair value is what happens. And I think that, you know, yes, you know, in the short run, if you press buy on 5 million shares of any stock in the stock market, it's going to go up. You're going to overwhelm the amount of sellers that there are temporarily. Over time, those sellers will, will come back and your price will return. And I've done this for 20 years where I've actually played these games in the stock market. I've, I've run experiments. I've said, all right, let me overwhelm the stock market with some buys right now in a certain stock. And this could be a big, large company like AbbVie, where I would go to Morgan Stanley and say, listen, I want to buy a million shares of AbbVie right now. And, uh, you know, the market maker would, would make me a market or I'd just do it the next day just with level two. I'd press buy and see what happens. So like, and some small stocks, I once bought 5% of Rick's Cabaret in a week and then I sold it all in about 30 minutes. And as you can imagine, in 30 minutes, the stock dropped like 10%. Um, but as I bought it slowly, it, it sort of affected the price probably a little bit less. So like, to me, all this stuff is kind of a, sh- a charade and a sh- sideshow. And I think like you can blame whatever you want when you're, the stock you buy doesn't go up. <laughs> and I think that the, the reality is the market's just doing its thing. And, you know, you can't really you can try to with it on mass. But again, the market has ways to sort of um, balance it out. For example... I was listening to the annual meeting uh, the other day, the recording. It wasn't recorded too well, but I could tell very very clearly, because I've been in his shoes before, that the CEO wanted to do a secondary pretty bad. Um, that, that he kept sort of saying, well, you guys don't want us to do it, but, you know, I, I more it, the tea leaves and the vibe that I got was like, he'd love to sell a, a secondary. And, and who wouldn't? Because he has all this debt to refinance. He's refinancing the debt at somewhat of a high rate. Equity has no interest, right? So just sell 10 million shares. You know, that's 100 million bucks. Sell 20 million shares. Sell 50 million shares. 50 million shares is not going to change the company. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of academic papers that show the debt equity uh, sort of equivalence or debt, debt equity parity that whether you raise equity or whether you raise debt in the long run actually makes no difference because your cost of capital is, is the same. I never realized that as a CEO of a publicly traded company, I really, really hated issuing equity. Because I felt it was dilutive to me as a larger shareholder. I didn't like that. And I wanted to skimp and get by on whatever I could get by on. And I would sometimes, if I could, I'd borrow money. And I'd borrow money at 10 or 12%. And the paper I read was like, showed me how dumb it was. That at the end of the day, like, basically your cost of capital is your cost of capital. So, But, but it, does, it does change the stage for, for 
the quote unquote low ask, right? Because you're, if you issue shares and there's more shares in the flow, it frees up more for shorting, right? So what I guess the belief is is that if but it you also, issue yeah. shares, yeah, it will stop. It will stop the quote unquote low ask. There'll be plenty of places for the shares to go because, for example, the short sellers probably would cover in, in a big offering. That's typically what shorts do. Um, in fact, they made Reg M just to stop that because uh, what we used to do in biotech, and I think everyone who's been around in biotech knows this kind of like an a open secret, is that when you look at a biotech company running out of money, you'd short the crap out of it, right? And then you'd... Um, when the company invariably came called around and was like, hey, you know, we're down to like a couple quarters of cash. We're looking to do a secondary. You know, when you get the call for the secondary, you cover your short in the secondary. And if you get warrants on top, it's even better. So if, let's say the company was trading at 12, you would short it and by far and large, they'll price a deal at 10, use the, 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 the pressure or the deal kind of price, the discount to the last sale, you go ahead and cover at 10 and then you, you're, on, you're on your way. So I think that's probably what, in fact, if I was short GM, GM, I'm sorry, if I was short AMC right now, let's say I shorted 10 million shares at 15. I would literally be going to the company, begging them, listen, you guys need capital. Let me buy 10 million shares at 12. You know, let me give you 120 million. Um, and I would that's pocket. Did. Yeah, exactly. I would pocket 30 million bucks and the company would have more capital and everybody would be happy. Um, now, the funny thing is the more capital the company gets, the more the bonds would trade up because they wouldn't default, right? They'd have money to pay the debt. So right now they're kind of playing a weird game where it's like, all right, you know what? We'll, we'll run our balance sheet to the bone. People, the bond market will wonder if we're even solvent, but at least we're not issuing equity. And it's kind of like, uh, I'm not sure this is going to do you any favors, you know? Well, Just that would be, that would be him valuing the retail investors more than the capital. Yeah, and it all comes. It all come out in the wash. I mean, you can you can try to skim. For example, I have them paying down their debt. And this is a little bit of a joke. Over the next six years, just a cash an EBITDA sweep. Basically, the EBITDA sweeps to to the debt, and they they would be unlevered and finally cash positive in two thousand and twenty eight, right? Which is like okay, fine. Never issue a share again. Um, it's a little bit silly. Uh, well, he refinanced the debt already up to 2029. So well, you we can know. keep pu- you can keep pushing it, right? I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. You know, their the debt market's as active as equity markets, so they'll they'll keep refining him, and basically, he'll probably spend. I mean, it'll probably be parity again. To my point, but like it'll basically be parity with doing an offering. Uh, there's no free launch for him. There's no free launch for the apes. There's no free launch for anybody, and that's why at the end of the day. <clears throat> you will simply um, get what you pay for, right? You're gonna you're buying a claim of a business, and that business is gonna probably make six, seven, eight hundred million dollars a year someday. You know, you also have to contend with this debt at the moment. When it all shakes out, and you put it in a calculator, your HP 12C or your Microsoft Excel, you're gonna get the same number I get. Now, if you have a special edge and you think the movie business can generate ten billion dollars for AMC, and you're right, you're gonna make money. It's gonna go long. If you think that movies are going away and they only can get to like three billion in revenue, okay, then then I'm wrong and it's going to go down and maybe even go bankrupt. But I think the reality is going to be somewhere in between. Neely, did you want to jump in? I do. I want to ask you a question on your process, Martin, if I can, for just a minute. Um, so AMC, just looking at the 14A, the definitive proxy. Yeah. And how much do you weigh into like looking at compensation changes? You know, more and more disclosures given on that. And if you just look at it on AMC right now, you can see that like their their long term comp just decreased from last year to this year, which means their short term comp increased, um, and then their variable comp decreased. And I feel like those are kind of two conflicting trends. But I'm just curious how much you weigh in with the 14A on your process. Thanks. Yeah, I look at it pretty closely, but the one thing I'd add is I just look at the cash comp because the the stock-based comp is very hard to actually parse because if you use Black Shoals and stuff like that, it's really not clear what the value of those options are. So the cash comp is unambiguous, right? Cash is cash. And um, these guys get paid a lot. Uh, (laughs) And uh, look, corporate that's partially it's corporate America. Uh, but at the same token, like if you're rich, you're a co-owner of the Philly 76ers, <clears throat> you're a CEO of Royal Caribbean, you got hundreds of millions of dollars. 
it doesn't really make much sense that you need a million and a half bucks. Um, but, you know, that's just me. That's just my style. Like, I never paid myself. My last drug company, I took a salary of zero. And the one before that, I took a salary of like two or $300,000. And our market cap wasn't that far away from AMC's. So, you know, it's just a weird number for me. Um, but it is. Do you add in their bonuses? Yeah, so it's about six million for. Do you consider their bonuses as cash? Okay. The cash bonus, the total cash comp for AA, last I checked, was six million, which for saving the company from bankruptcy, yeah. uh, quote unquote, saving the company from bankruptcy, depending how you look at it. Um, I don't know. That seems like a lot for a company that's knee deep in debt. Um, now I'm come from the school where every dollar matters. But for them, I think they're looking at it and saying, well, we have $5 billion in debt. What's six million of wasteful spending? We have to pay our CEO something. Um, I just don't like that kind of spending. Uh, when you add in the board comp, that's another million or so, million and a half. Even the audit comp I thought was too expensive. Um, I thought it was high too. Yeah. That was a high number. Yeah. It's a, a lot of money going to a whole lot of nothing. Yeah, that was a high number too. I, I agree with your assessment there. Just related, one more related number to step back down. And that is, I totally agree with you on the uh, CEO comp. I think that's one analysis. But I also think it's kind of interesting when you look at the non-CEO pay, right? Oh, Disclosures. Yeah. Because, you know, if you think about organizations are people, people are patterns, patterns are, sure. you know, it matters more to the people, right, than it does to the CEO, to your point, right? So I guess that's where, you know, do you get do you get into that sort of deep of the weeds, or are you just kind of looking at the CEO pay? It gets really uh, bad with me. I mean, I'm kind of a nitpicker and a crazy person, so I, I I'll actually make a list of. Uh, one time I was trading one stock. I made a list of every employee, and I tried to get salaries for every single person. And if you're um, plugged into the industry that you're in, like you can actually get that kind of information be- through headhunters and other uh, friends of uh, friends and things like that. Like. So if you know good headhunters, you know who's looking for jobs, you know what the rumors are about pay at those jobs, you get all the scuttlebutt and water cooler talk. Um, you know, scuttlebutt is an old term from Phil Fisher uh, in that book I mentioned, uh, Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. It's an old term that means, just means grapevine, really. Grapevine's an old term too, right? But um, ultimately, like, you can find out whatever you need to find out. Um, and... Uh, it, de- it depends on how you approach it. I mean, I certainly don't like sneaking around, but some of it requires a little bit of being coy about your interests. Um, obviously, you know, asking the guy behind the stand, uh, you know, who's serving you the the, the candy and, and uh, popcorn is probably not going to get you very far. But in terms of people in the corporate office and things like that, you know, you can probably get a decent sense for what's going on. Um, so I do care a lot about that stuff. Obviously, the NEOs named executive officers are the only people that you're going to get strictly exact comp information for, but you can certainly hear about what the company's kind of, at least directionally, what kind of uh, stuff they're paying. Sometimes you can see job postings and they they have sort of uh, areas of comp. I really like to look at it because I like to see like one company that I was critical of and I got their CEO fired. um, They had a really uh, crazy kind of like legal and HR function where for a small sort of pharmaceutical company, I think they had a legal department of 10 people and HR of like six and I was just like, wait, this is nuts. Like, this is way too much spending. And it was indicative of broader spending problems at the company that I was criticizing as a shareholder. And I ended up being right, I think. Um, uh, again, there are some companies that treat their their businesses as their... It's weird, but it's like an egotistical thing, if, you've, if you know what I'm talking about, to be the CEO of a company and have two or 300 people salute you every day as like the boss. And you're like... Yeah, why not another hundred people? You know, you just kind of don't care. And you're adding employees who are like, oh, so-and-so's cousin or, you know, again, you sort of feel like the head honcho and it's sort of a ridiculous thing when in reality, you're supposed to be really frugal with the company's resources. And you can just tell when a company's doing that and when a company's not doing that. And I think that it doesn't mean you don't pay your people. You have to pay people. You want to pay for good talent, but you also have to sort of think about, well, is this person the best talent? And I actually think Adam Aaron's resume is pretty good. Um, how in touch is he with this industry and how like, what is he to best practices and good operations? I don't know. I think the 95, maybe even 99 out of 100 Fortune 500 CEOs would never do the gold deal that he did, the Highcroft deal. I do think where there's smoke, there's fire. I'm giving them a pass on this, even though I really shouldn't. And I'm just saying, okay, this is a one and done. He's going to basically eat. On what you were saying before about the giving of a 
have money to and see. So on the last earnings call, I'm sure you heard it, he said that he was holding back $100 million to make an, another investment into uh, a, I'm guessing, a distressed company. Yeah, and that's, I, that. it, it, I think it's crazy. You know, I think that, you know, to become an investment company, I mean, to be a really good investment company, I think it's actually dovetails with what I was saying earlier, where like 100 to 500 hours of research, right, to, to make an investment. In private equity, you know, per person, you actually do more, not per person, but like a, a grouped as a team, private equity teams will do thousand thousand hours of plus of research to make a private equity investment and he's doing more or less private equity style investing and i don't think he's quite doing the research or no has the sort of intelligence not intelligence but let's say domain expertise to make an investment in a, in a different field like that i don't know i think that's really suspect like i i really i'm like i said i'm gonna give it a pass uh a hundred million at a time cannot screw a company that's worth five or six billion dollars up, but it certainly doesn't bode well. And eventually, that person gets fired if those investments don't work, right? And I bet these investments won't work. And that's the corrective, self-corrective mechanism that there will be a reckoning, right? In two years, if Highcroft's worth nothing and whatever second investment he makes is worth nothing, the the board just says, "Hey, pal, it's time to retire." Right. And they stuck. He is. He's the chairman of the board. Yeah, but he's 67. I right. think he'll be retiring at some point soon either way. And I bet you if those investments don't go well, the new board says, yeah, we're not doing those strategic deals anymore. We're going to focus on our core business. And that'll probably be the best move either way. But listen, maybe the deals work out really well. I'm just valuing them at a write off, which means if they go up, there's more upside to the shares. Uh, but, you know, like, you know, they, they're. And there very well might be. I don't know.